Um, <laughs> are we ready on HQ? All right, thank you. So good evening. I would like to welcome you to the December 1st regular meeting of the school committee. And if you all could join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I'll take a, a quick moment to run through our agenda for the evening and then we will get started. Um, I don't think at this time, Dr. McLeod, we had any agenda switches that we wanted to suggest or did we? Uh, when Mr. Keller arrives, if you could take him out of order, um, that would be very much appreciated. Okay, when is Mr. Keller supposed to be? He's under new business. School. Got it, okay. Um, so our agenda for the evening is recognitions and then the first opportunity for public comment. We then have reports to the school committee, potentially from student council, any liaison reports, the chair report, superintendent's report, um, as well as our preliminary budget reports from the special education department and our curriculum and professional development. Um, the new business for the evening is a handbook amendment for the middle school by Mr. Keller, as well as a parking agreement with the um, Hopkinton Center for the Arts. We have our second opportunity for public comment, and then we'll have our items by consensus. So at this time, Dr. McLeod, are there any recognitions for the evening? There are no recognitions for tonight. Anybody else in the committee have any recognitions? I can't remember if we did the top of the hill last time. We, we did. did, but you didn't know all the names at the time, so you were slightly embarrassed by that. Oh, other people well, that I'm embarrassed there. to say I don't remember them now. <laughs> the presentation, but it was an outstanding <laughs> presentation and evening, and um, I hope you'll all watch it on HCAM. There we go. <laughs> um, okay. Well, any other recognitions for the evening? Great. Um, it is our first opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak this time? Um, being that there's no one here to speak, I believe. Um, we can move on to the reports of the school committee. And our first report would be from student council, but I don't see oh, them present no. this evening, which is a little bit of a bummer, but I don't know if it's exam time or what's going on. They're so fun. I know. Yeah. So. Maybe every week seems press throwing them off. But we can move on. We can move on to our liaison reports, and if anyone in the committee had any liaison meetings in recent history that we haven't discussed. I just have upcoming meetings. Um, yeah. Which is easy to remember because the next meeting of the elementary school building committee is Monday, December 5th, and the next meeting of the uh, field subcommittee is Monday, Monday December 5th. 5th. Same so time. Yeah. Also, the middle school sixth grade chorus concert is Monday, December 5th, so I'm not going <coughs> to either of them. But, um, Good but, to know. So, yes. but, I ha but just because you said that, I got a text from today from Al Rogers forming footings. They may be pouring concrete on Tuesday. Ooh. Very wow. exciting. Wow. Let me go see it. That's crazy. It's very cool to drive. But do you want to go put your handprint in it? There's been a lot of street sweeping going on. <laughs> oh, we were we were at a meeting today with with all the elementary principals and Lauren was Lauren could not contain herself when we got this text. That's really yes. Awesome. Well, that's so if we exciting. Show up there, they'll let us put our. <laughs> I'd be better, right? <laughs> I think they would be more apt to let you spray paint your name on a steel beam than put your <laughs> footing well, in a happen. footing <laughs> that actually holds the building up. <laughs> Um, any other liaison reports today? I do. Uh, the day before our next meeting is the forum on the charter. So we have completed our review and we have, um, we are finalizing the proposed revisions to the charter. So it's really important that everybody attend um, on Wednesday, December 7th at 7 at the Senior Center. So you can hear the proposed um, revisions and weigh in on that and then um, the hope is that the special town meeting to vote on the charter will be on January 30th but that's oh, okay. TBD um, I assume you're gonna be there that night I will be there I night. will be unfortunately in Boston because I have to be at a reception for the mass conference for women that evening so I will miss out um, are there any other committee members that'll be able to attend on that one I don't think I will be able to go. Okay. I don't think I will either have a all day thing. Because <clears throat> um, I would like to hear what's going Is on. Is that going to be taped? 
Yes, I, yeah, I'm sure it is. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, right? And where did you say it was? At town It's hall? at the senior center senior at 7 center. o'clock. Okay. So invite I your can, friends and neighbors. I believe I can go. Are there documents that can be looked they, at oh, ahead thank of time you. to provide comments? Thank you, for? Nancy. Yes, there are. <laughs> um, yes. If you cannot attend, uh, <laughs> uh, you can email Pam Waxlax, and her email is on the town website. Uh, I think tomorrow the um, cleaned up version of the proposal is going to be posted. They're just finishing um, finishing that up. So yes, that, thank you very much for saying that. That will be available as of tomorrow. So if you can't okay. attend, please look it over. And there's a, a document that explains the high, at a high level what the changes are. Jean, I'm sorry, did you say 7 o'clock? <clears throat> 7 o'clock. Any other liaison reports? Um, my voice is going to be an issue tonight. I'll just warn you, Kelly. I might I be like over. passing it yeah, along. That's fine. Um, that night. The uh, oh, the one that I couldn't speak at no, all. No, I couldn't remember. Oh, I, was I just, had that happen. I was just. So I, I think my sorry. Yes. my kids feel it's hysterical. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> um, I had this like I said the CPAC meeting. The next CPAC meeting will be next, not next 13th. week, two weeks. Um, the 13th, so I don't have any update there um, other than Dr. McLeod and Dr. Zaleski will be attending along with um, Accept Transportation to discuss the changes and remediations that they've put in place in light of the report that we all read over last week. Um, so I'll have a better update after that meeting. And um, that'll actually be just prior to our last meeting of December for, uh, hopefully, for our last meeting of December on the budget. And as for a chair report, I, I actually really don't have much to report. There has not, I have only had one message from the community in relation to our budget this evening, which I passed along to all of you today. Um, and then otherwise it's been very quiet. Um, so I will turn over to Dr. McLeod for the superintendent's okay. report. So, um, Mr. Dumas is going to begin the superintendent's report with a budget recap. Mr. Dumas. Sure thing. So, the colorful uh, recap that I handed out today reflects some adjustments that were made as a result of um, the last meeting and also as a result of some uh, central office, uh, you know, administrative team uh, meetings. So uh, two weeks ago, the budget increase that we were uh, requesting was 4.66%. Uh, as of tonight, going into tonight's meeting, we're now down to 4.34%. Uh, there was one area uh, that had an increase. That would be at the high school. That's the green highlighted number. Um, uh, Evan will be uh, discussing the details of that next week. Um, Buildings and grounds, we reduced uh, two extraordinary maintenance uh, requests. One was the air conditioning at the um, conference room, and the other one was for, for some exterior paving. Uh, technology, uh, Ashok sharpened his pencil and uh, knocked off, I think, about $50,000, uh, most of which was at the uh, El Elmwood School, having to do with Chromebooks. Uh, athletics um, had been asking for an increase in the rates paid to um, game officials, and I'm not talking referees, uh, ticket takers, score, scoreboard operators, crowd control, that sort of thing. Uh, in the final analysis, we discussed it and we level funded it. Uh, and curriculum leadership um, was reduced by about $16,000, uh, uh, some uh, we're going to be um, taking care of some books that were on the request for next year out of some money that we know is going to be available this year because of a, of a grant. Okay. And then uh, special education, um, you'll be hearing more about uh, that uh, tonight and next Thursday when the principals are here. So um, we're heading in the right direction. Thank you. Do you have a, another copy of that? I do. That, that's an extra. Yeah. Mr. Oh, I was, I was going to hand it all to him. Yeah. Okay. Um, the second part of my um, report has to do with uh, the planning board meeting, the, um, the draft master plan that Nancy and I attended. Was it last week? Mm -hmm. 
I think Monday. it was last Monday. Um, and and Lori, the in response to we we basically summarized all of your comments, <coughs> and we had a very good discussion, very positive discussion. They welcomed all of the suggestions, and the my offer to um, make make some changes, propose some changes. So the first one was around the school enrollment data. They were actually very surprised to hear that information. Um, regarding uh, page 16 of their document where they had stated um, it's just one sentence so I can read it um, total enrollment is predicted to decline slowly over the next 10 years um, so we thought it was really important to have that conversation and we had a quite a nice discussion about it didn't we Nancy they were very interested and receptive to to understanding what those 330 additional projected and that's only what's projected we know that we've been we've been seeing um, students that have been arriving that have been beyond projection every year and then they start over again with with our current they, they adjust their beginning from where our October 1 is so the, I, I'm I'm not convinced that 330 is going to be the max can I just ask one question about that because mm -hmm. um, I know you had when you and I had spoke about the recap on the meeting and that they hadn't yet received our paper comments but you had discussed some of them with them live and then they afterwards received it but had they received our NASDAQ yes report? Okay. yes they had but they hadn't shared the, those results with the larger board Got and it. so but yes they confirmed that they'd received that um, we discussed the Hayden Row traffic calming initiative the uh, updating the school district awards and recognitions that Lori had included in her letter to basically you know it, it, it was back to 2006 and they welcomed an update in that regard um, the school size reference how important it was to talk about capacity and the number of classrooms and anticipated enrollment and not just square footage um, and then the final one um, I added on page 59 where they have um, their action plan there was nothing in the action plan that that indicated that they, we would want to be monitoring and planning for the potential to increased enrollment um, and I really feel that that's an important part of the ongoing action as a town across departments that we be working together to be aware of and planning for um, the potential to increase enrollment and what that might mean and we talked about the fact that it's year four and we are breaking ground on a new school this all takes a long long time so um, it was again it was a very positive meeting did you want to add anything Nancy no I thought you did a great job uh, presenting thank you all of that to the committee great well thank you and and again this this was uh, all of us working together to um, review the document and and to provide some highlights um, on part of the school committee so I'll follow up with all of those um, pieces with the planning board and then the final part of my um, my report was that uh, at the last meeting Lori had presented um, through her role as liaison to CPAC some concerns that had been brought to her attention as well as Dr. Zaleski's attention regarding um, transportation concerns with accept and it's, it was quite a like a four page document of concerns um, Karen and Ralph and I met with the director the the director of accept Marsha Berkowitz and her finance director Bill Hurley the following Tuesday um, and we met for a couple of hours and talked about this entire list they had received it they had responses to it um, and it was actually their suggestion that we invite <coughs> them to the next CPAC meeting so they will be there on the 13th um, to provide a, a, a direct response to the concerns that were brought to their attention um, and Dr. Zaleski we had a great conversation collaborative conversation about the parts of this that were district based the parts of this that were accept generated and how we're going to work more effectively together the things that have already been in, put in place and the things that need to be put in place for example for this coming ESY program um, so I just wanted to report back because that did come in under reports at our last meeting that I think we're making really good great progress in that regard and I know that many of us in fact all of us Carol will be there and I'll be there and Lori you'll be there um, so we'll all be joining Dr. Zaleski at the CPAC meeting on December the 13th just so you all are aware too like the CPAC meetings are all um, posted if if we if more 
local committee members want to be there and we need to jointly post just let me know ahead of time and I can work with Megan to do so um it's not it's not like I have to be the only person there um, and certainly the group is very welcoming to um, to, our, to our being there so it it I think it certainly is helpful in terms of like our budgeting and understanding more fully like what some of the services actually are because for any of us that don't have students with special needs especially myself because it's been an education process for me that sometimes just helps to understand what the services actually are and Dr. Seleski often has very um, helpful um, presentations that I learn a lot from as well so I'm just extending that invitation and I'm certainly w um, willing to make it you know a public meeting with Megan if we need to so great and that's my report. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Keller did arrive in the room. Mr. Keller is in the room. <laughs> Stop talking about Mr. Keller. See, there's no sirens that went off or anything. Um, okay, so Mr. Keller, would you like to come up and scoot on in ahead of the uh, budget presentations? I hope you have to um, so at this point, we're taking letter A of new business, which is the middle school handbook amendment, and Mr. Keller is going to walk us through the updated, just to make sure you're looking at the updated memos that I handed you tonight. Okay. So not all of us have looked at the refreshed version, sure. so feel free to give us the cliff notes. Never had any yes. Um, uh, yeah, so thank you, and my apologies to those I'm, I'm going in front of. But uh, so essentially, um, I have two um, mid-year ch change proposals to the handbook. So the first one is a, a change to honor roll. Um, so in um, preparing to roll over from IPASS into um, PowerSchool, uh, our technology team alerted us to um, some things that are different within PowerSchool as, as opposed to, uh, as compared to IPASS. So, <clears throat> excuse me, at present, um, in our handbook, it says that, um, or, or the way we run honor roll is that uh, honor roll is based on a numerical average of His core name. subjects, so math, science, English, social Thank studies, you. and foreign language. Um, and so then um, within those, uh, within that's our general uh, procedure with honor roll. And so then I'll talk about the three individual pieces of that. So high honors is for students with an A average in core subjects along with no grade, and that includes related arts below a B. Um, uh, and then honors is for uh, a B plus average in core subjects. Again, the math, English, science, social studies, and foreign language. Uh, but students cannot have any grade, including related arts, below a B minus. And then students will receive a commended for a B average in core subjects, allowed to have a C plus, provided no other grades. Again, the related arts classes below a B minus. Um, so there's something that's a little bit different as we move to power school in that um, we cannot have, um, it doesn't allow for um, uh, uh, um, to have kind of a major a difference in the major minor piece. And so we, uh, once I got this information, I met with um, my leadership team, uh, Mrs. Grady and uh, Mrs. Ben Benick, and then met with my counseling team. And so we had lengthy discussions about this. And so ultimately um, believe that um, this kind of prompted a conversation that which we never really had before and um, would like to recommend a change to that. Um, Ultimately, we think it's better. It's, it's kind of, it was prompted by the change to power school, but we think it actually is better for our students. And so the proposal then is that instead of saying um, you must have an A average in core subjects as we do now, uh, it would be an A average in all of the classes. So it would be your core subjects plus related arts uh, along with no grade below a B. Um, and that's high honors. And then honors would be for a B plus average in all classes, again, including the related arts, along with no grade below a B minus. So in that scenario, and when you look at honors, uh, a child could actually have, in math, could have a B in math, but still make honors. Uh, in the past, that would, not, that would not be the case. And so we talked at length about the possibility um, of students who are extremely successful in those <coughs> things, but maybe isn't strong in math, maybe isn't strong in humanities, but can still actually be an honor roll student. And so um, we like the idea of actually including all the classes and also giving an opportunity for a student who uh, may not be A plus in all subjects to still have an opportunity to be on our honor roll. And finally then commended would be for a B average in all classes, again including related arts, allowing for one C plus provided no other grades are below a B minus. So essentially the difference between the two and what I'm proposing as a change is that uh, we're including all classes as opposed to just the core classes. 
And Mr. Keller, is this how we do it at the high school right now? <clears throat> Uh, it is very similar to how we do it at the high school, yes. Um, it, fe it felt like the middle school was, was making it a little bit more difficult, I mean, in, in that it was only, they did not include related arts, if I'm saying that properly. Um, so it also makes us more consistent in, in how we are identifying. Incorrect, Jean? Yeah, no, the high school does not include um, the uh, electives, non-academic electives in the grade point average. Non-academic electives. Right. In the grade point average, grade right? Point but average. not honor roll. Oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, so I, the language, yeah, okay. the language I have here is that the high school says um, the honor roll is calculated on the unweighted average of all subjects. So high honors okay. is an A slash A plus average with all grades B or above. Yep. Okay. And then, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you, Mr. Keller. I think that you've had some very um, important conversations around all of this, and I like the way you framed it in terms of it's been something that you know kind of resulted in a conversation that maybe hadn't happened but is is your feeling and your your team is feeling is actually you're more comfortable with as a way of identifying honors yeah certainly not um really comfortable coming and making a, a mid-year change to the handbook but um this again as dr mcleod just said it prompted a conversation that i think was a was a really healthy one and we actually were meeting with students um yesterday uh mrs ben bennick and i were meeting with some seventh grade students and talking about on a roll and they were giving us a lot of mm -hmm. important feedback and so one of the things that I want to do if, if approved or if not approved uh, is to is to continue this conversation so I have a faculty coffee tomorrow we're going to talk about honor roll uh, and we're going to continue to talk about it at um, school council as well as at um, with my principal's advisories to talk about um, the importance of honor roll and uh, what this means to them and so this is timely because we are going live with power school on december the 6th and that's why again not only is it a mid-year change to the handbook um, but in order to be able to start using power school to calculate make these calculations um, that's why we had to kind of get it on the agenda last minute for you so mr keller how um assuming it's approved tonight how are you communicating this with students and parents yeah, so we would need to, if approved, then we would need to obviously send a listserv uh, tomorrow uh, to parents to make them aware that this change would be effective with uh, beginning with term two, which actually begins on, de on December 6th uh, for us. And so, uh, and then of course with students as well. We have actually meetings with students that are set up uh, to talk about other subjects, but this would be one of the things that we would mention to them as well. And do you anticipate that, my only concern would be that if somebody would have made honor roll in the other way the system was calculated, is there a potential that people would not make the honor roll in the way the new system's calculated? Um, I, I, I don't, I mean, um, I, we kind of looked at the different scenarios. I don't believe, um, and we looked at like five different scenarios and kind of figuring out how we wanted them to look at this, but <coughs> I don't believe um, that a student who previously would have made high honors would now no longer make it. Um, um, yeah, well, I mean, actually, that, that, excuse me, that is possible in this scenario because you could have all C's in your related arts courses and, and not make the honor roll. But you're, you're not retroactively Correct. applying We're, it. So term the, one, term will, one be, will stay in yes. December 6th, so this will be communicated before term two even starts. Right. Correct. Oh, so they, have, yeah. they then have the opportunity to pay right. attention. So, yeah. so you can't slack on related arts because it's right. going to impact your honor roll op right. opportunities. Yes. Got it. I understand. That makes sense. Thanks, Sean. Does anyone else have any questions? I don't have any questions. I, I think it's, I mean, the, the, I understand that, the, I mean, it's great that that was the driver. It feels like it, we tout this sort of whole education aspect and Absolutely. the calculation of the honor roll excluding the related arts classes feels like it's making them less. And I agree. I, we have phenomenal related arts classes in the middle school, so I think this is a really positive change. Yeah, and there's definitely, uh, thank you, I, I think that's definitely been one of the conversations I've had with related arts staff is um, in, in some cases feeling as though they are kind of second tier teachers. And so this is one of the things that um, I think will go a long way in terms of making them feel as though they're on, on par with, with the other teachers. Yeah, that no. makes sense. Yeah, I think we've had a lot of conversations that related arts are not extracurriculars. Right. And um, so I think this reinforces the importance and, and certainly supports the whole STEAM, STEM conversation that we've had as part of the strategic plan. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's one of those aha moments like that. Exactly. <laughs> yes. why, why was that not like that? But I think it's a really great. No, yeah. yeah, I think that's wonderful. 
Okay, so I know that there are two changes that you're proposing, and do you, do you want to explain the second one, and then we can just vote on them after? Okay. Sure. So the second one uh, also relates to our handbook and that it uh, addresses athletics and uh, participation in athletics. So um, about three weeks ago, I believe, or maybe um, two, two and a half weeks ago, not that I, I'm not sure why I feel like I need to be really specific on that, but uh, Ms. <laughs> uh, Earlier last week. <laughs> um, Ms. King, our athletic director, received an inquiry from a grade, uh, parent of a grade six student as to whether or not her child can participate in, on our wrestling team. So our handbook states that um, sports are open to eighth grade students, uh, and then that we have, uh, most of our sports are open to eighth grade students, and then we have three sports, uh, wrestling, cross country, and track and field, that are open to seventh and eighth grade students. And those three sports are open because essentially they are, are non-cut sports. Um, and um, so Ms. King and I met and then had a conversation with Dr. Uh, McLeod, and uh, we discussed um, the potential and the impact of uh, opening up grade six to wrestling. So there's really three things, um, and a lot of things that we talked about, we really felt like three factors kind of played out in this. Um, number one, the number of students participating in wrestling is, is small. Um, so there wouldn't be a significant impact. Uh, there would be virtually no impact on, on, uh, on a coach. We don't need, we wouldn't need an additional coach um, to add to accommodate a sixth grade student. Uh, and then ultimately, we, we also wouldn't need to, uh, it wouldn't place a burden on facilities at all. The students practice and then have their meets in the Doyle gym. Um, again, it's, it's, real, it's low numbers relatively, and so we felt as though um, we could accommodate a sixth grade student and add, not a, a sixth grade student, we could accommodate sixth grade, and we don't believe that once we open it up to grade six, if approved, um, that we would have an overwhelming response and would be able to accommodate with our facilities and, and with uh, the one coach that we have for our middle school team. And so, at this time, after the three of us uh, conversed, we felt comfortable recommending on a trial basis to add grade six to our wrestling program. Uh, Mr. Keller, as a point of clarification, when you're talking about a trial basis, does this mean you're not tonight looking for a change to the language in the handbook on page 13? Um, I believe that's, that's correct. Dr. Right. I believe I would be asking to do this for this year and yep. try it out. Um, and to see if um, if it's if successful, uh, yep. and then at the end of the year assess, or at the end of the season assess, and determine if we want to make that a permanent change moving forward. Right, because you know, just to point out to the to the committee that we had also talked about the possibility of you know other non-cut sports, such as cross country and um, track and field, right. also being open to sixth graders. Um, but there could be potentially be a, f a financial impact there, because unlike wrestling. Um, there are a ton of kids in, in, in track and cross country, which we love. It's a wonderful problem. So Mr. Keller wanted to have some time along with D. King to really evaluate what it might mean. Um, obviously, encouraging athletic um, exercise of any sort is something that we want to be able to do. Um, and if you ever went out to watch, a cross, was it the cross country team I yes. saw? or the? It, it was just, it was, it was really wonderful to see all those kids out on a beautiful day after school just running. Um, so just so I'm clear then, we will not be looking for a change to the handbook tonight, but for approval that you um, open up the wrestling team to sixth grade for the, rem well, for this season. Yes. Okay. <coughs> I think it makes sense. Yep. yep. Do you know if other middle school teams, the sixth graders, participate? Um, I do not. I know um, Miss King uh, had done some research, um, and I don't remember the number. I know she said there are other other schools that are that have grade six in the wrestling program, but I don't remember the number. Okay, I'm I'm just curious. I, I mean, just... I can. The only one thing I can speak to is that like there's a a wrestling program in Milford that starts at kindergarten, um, so it's. It's, and, and I'm not saying that's necessarily school affiliated, but like right. it, the, the program in and of itself does start at younger ages. So it's not, I wouldn't expect that a sixth grader that's interested in wrestling wouldn't have had any prior experience going into wrestling. Oh, yeah. No, I was just thinking from a safety standpoint, this size, size. differential size is difference, yeah. kind of oh, notable. Well, there's but there's class, weight right? classes from in sixth wrestling. Grade to eighth grade. That's yeah. what I learned. Right. That was my question to Dee. I was imagining this little, this little sixth grader, you know, on the wrestling team, and she was like, oh, no, they, they would have to fit into their weight class no matter what. And, um, and in fact, that, that's not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Great. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Heller. So at this time, I would seek a motion to, uh, there's two motions before us. The, seek a motion to approve the recommended changes to the middle school honor rule designation and the subsequent change to the handbook as outlined in your agenda materials. So moved. Second. Um, sorry, motion by Mr. Graziano, seconded by Mrs. Birchman. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? No, and it's unanimous and so carries. Um, our second motion has changed. It would end no. after rest. Yeah, okay, it, we're yeah. not doing the subsequent change to the handbook. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I seek a motion to approve the sixth grade participation on the middle school wrestling team for the school year 2016-2017 as outlined in the agenda materials. So moved. Second. Motion by Mrs. Kavanaugh, seconded by Mrs. Birchman. All those in favor? Yes. Yes. Yes, and it's unanimous and so carries. Thank you, Mr. Keller. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, you Mr. Keller. Okay, so we will return to our regularly scheduled program, which is the preliminary budget reports, and I believe we are starting with the Special Education Department and Dr. Zinsky. And except that I see Mr. Hur is here, yeah, he um, and I know that <laughs> he doesn't want to be we invited we invited, I don't know if there are other um, appropriations or, no? Nobody, um, nobody. So that means we have to kind of think a little bit differently about our presentations, because I had been thinking about um, Dr. Zaleski and Dr. Kavanaugh sitting there together. So maybe what we'll do at this time, Dr. Kavanaugh, if you don't mind, is we will ask Dr. Zaleski to come up and sit here. Sure. Um, and we'll ask Mr. Herr to sit there. I tried to get Thank out of you. It, but it's not happening. Yeah. I was ready to go back. <laughs> 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 They're so good chairs. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're trying to do. I can do slides if you want. She'll do your slides. Do you want me to move your slides? No, no, we're trying to Just encourage right audience participation. <laughs> oh, you don't want to be looking behind you. Okay. <clears throat> then you go sit beside Mr. Herr. Yeah. And Dr. Okay. Kavanaugh, you can stay I'm right here. I'm thinking the same thing. I'm like, Thank all right. Well, I didn't know she'd do it. All right, thank you for your flexibility, everybody, on the arrangements. <laughs> I'll follow up. So can I just ask, um, I know Mr. Dumas handed us out some updated presentations. Was any of it for? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did Mr. Hart get a copy? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. <laughs> took us a while to get that. All right. Dr. Zaleski, whenever you're ready. <laughs> I'm ready. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I did a PowerPoint slide just to start off the presentation. Um, all of you folks have a copy of my executive summary. So just to start, the overview of my budget, the preliminary FY18 budget is $9,154,452. And this reflects an increase of 529000 from the FY17 budget, or an increase of 6.13. So the increases are primarily due to transportation, salaries and private school tuitions. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to click through a few slides. Rather than read through my whole executive summary, I'm just going to click on to the areas that are outlined in the summary and then open it up for discussion as we go along. So in my summary, we have adjustments. There's also new personnel positions and some reductions in personnel. So if the committee would like to take the opportunity to look at my summary and um, ask me any questions regarding the specific points, maybe starting with the adjustments. As you can see in the adjustments section, I have some paraprofessionals from adjusted from FY18 to 17 to 18. Um, we added a transition specialist stipend as well as a 0.5 speech to support student service delivery. And um, if you folks have any specific questions to those areas, I'd be happy to discuss that. Well, okay. If we move so, on to I'm sorry, yes. the, so the stipend, but that is that that's not a change from this year though. That's currently a stipend in position this it's year. It's a it's a stipend position. Yes. This so year, yeah. yep. that was not that's in the budget. A, for it's a 17, 17 to 17. 18 adjustment. It's an adjustment. So this is current. Right. Yeah. So we have it now, but it wasn't. Yeah. We didn't. It wasn't in our voted budget. Right. Last, last year, it, we've added it. Yes. So, but now it's going to be added. So going forward. last year, though, the way it was in the budget was. Uh, 0.5 FTE yes. that we were unsuccessful in finding candidates for. Correct. Um, is there a reason 
that we didn't in the budget this year propose a 1.0 FTE in an effort to find more, more candidates for the position? Yes. So the reasons for that are twofold. Um, so whenever I make budget decisions that are going to be permanent, um, especially at a 1.0 level, I like to have data to back up my decision making. This position is uh, a very new position, not only new to our district, but uh, new to the state. So the Department of Education has come out with a transition specialist endorsement license for folks. And um, there's a lot of DESE approved programs that people go through to get that licensure because it's so new. I believe that the 0.5 position, the reason it was difficult to fill was first because it's a 0.5, but also because it's so new, a lot of people don't yet have that endorsement. I didn't feel it was wise to put it in the budget as a 1.0 because it's such a new position statewide, but also I don't have the data right now to support whether or not it's working in our district, and I didn't want to put it in the budget as a permanent position until I have that data. So I am proposing it next year as a stipend posi position as well because it is my hope that the work the transition specialist does this year. I'll have the data based on the families that he's working with and the success rates of the students in terms of transition planning and their placements to support the need going forward. So I guess my question with that is, I mean, obviously our budget timeline is so early in the year mm -hmm. that you don't have the data yet because of the fact that right. they've only been doing this for a couple months, if that. Um, I, so the, the problem in the juxtaposition I guess I have and is the fact that I mean, we have some legal requirements on the district in order to provide transition assistance mm -hmm. to special education students that are running the, I believe it's as early as age 14. Yes. And it's my understanding that our general education guidance counselors aren't able to provide that level of service. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure out how even though we want to get data, so assuming we get data this year that's really positive, and we, if we're not budgeting for it now, we really have a really hard time switching gears come June when we have all this data, and it may have had such a great impact. Um, I just have concerns about this particular position not, mm -hmm. it, not, not being more seriously looked at for next year. Um, in light of the fact that we felt strongly enough about it last year to put it in as a 0.5 FTE, and yet mm -hmm. now I feel like we're backtracking looking for data, but we didn't have the data last year when we put mm -hmm. it in. Mm -hmm. Understood. And so um, to your point, just to help educate the committee a little bit, transition planning is a lawful requirement. The transition endorsement and having a licensed transition specialist is not. How we meet and how districts have met, including this district, over the years, um, several years, is the team chairs are responsible for transition planning. So I want folks to know that even if we don't have a 1.0 transition specialist in district, the team chairs are in place to provide that support. Now the difference from this year to last year is, if you recall, last year we had one team chair split between two buildings. And the difficulty to properly transition plan on top of not having a transition specialist warranted my decision making to try and post it as a point five. However, budget got approved. We did have a, an additional team chair added. Again, now that I have a team chair at both the middle school and the high school, which is where the transition planning takes place, and that's new to me this year, between that position and the stipend position, I, again, need to assess the effectiveness of the need for a 1.0. Adding a 1.0 position when I have a now full-time person at my high school and middle school on top of a transition specialist feels like a lot of personnel to me when I don't have the data to fully support whether or not I need both those positions full time. I know I need the team chair full time, and that was justified through um, you know the data I presented last year as well as the coordinated program review outcome. But I, I do feel like it's too early um, to so put that I'm, in place. If I may add, uh, Dr. Zaleski, uh, one of the things that I've charged our director of pupil services to do is to improve efficiencies, to make sure that students are getting everything that they need and she you will see later in her presentation that that includes appropriate out-of-district placements um, 
restraint training, etc. And in doing this, she's she's also challenged to, to work within a budget. So as the rest of us, she has to evaluate programmatic changes and make make recommendations for her budget within it. Um, as you point out, it was it was very clear that running the buildings without um, each having their own chair created its own problems. Mm -hmm. um, but in addition, something that we've learned in the process is that our district was way out in front with bringing on transition um, transition specialists, as you you hear me talk all the time about mandates from DESE. Um, and Dr. Zaleski worked with, with a um, outside specialist to come and do some training. But what we learned is that possibly the reason the pool was so shallow when we did try to hire is that this is a very new um, requirement for districts that is not actually currently in place. Um, but what we're doing is we're preparing for it. And while we're, we're, while we're preparing for it, um, training is being taken, has taken place and individual um, families have been offered transition planning um, as needed. So I believe that what Dr. Zaleski is doing is, is extremely responsible because she's planning for an implementation of a, of a position that is going to be needed with an individual who is already in the role, knows the kids, knows the families, and is currently working on his certification. Um, so we'll he'd be hearing more about this. I mean, it mm -hmm. could be that as um, the requirements grow, so too does the position. Um, but I am very confident that the recommendation being made around the transition specialist at this time is the right one. Um, and Mr. Dumas reminded me that, in fact, it was not budgeted FY17. Mm -hmm. It was something that we looked at, at adding on in the summer mm -hmm. when we were making some other adjustments. Um, adjustments? Yes. <clears throat> so. So yeah, in fairness, Dr. Zaleski, I did not give you this question ahead of time. And so if you don't have these numbers, I certainly would welcome an update for us, because obviously we have mm -hmm. ongoing budget meetings that we're getting updates from past questions. Sure. But what is the pool of, of uh, and I don't mean, obviously we're not speaking in individuals here at all in cases, but percentage-wise of special education students we have in district, how many are in this 14 to 22 age range mm -hmm. that um, would at least give me some indication of what the need is versus the rest of the needs of the district on special education services? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't have those numbers specific to age 14 and up, I would have to get that data. Sure. We are a district with 13% special education, so within that 13%, the students 14 and up are, are required to have a transition plan that have an IEP. Now, some of those transition plans are um, fulfilled with the team chair providing some minimal supports depending on what the needs are. As you know, individualized educational planning is exactly that. It's individualized, and so some of the plans require less attention and some require more. For instance, some plans can require connection to a vocational opportunity, pursuit of a driver's license, connection to a mass rehab, whereas other plans might require extensive involvement for adult living. And um, even if I had the data and numbers, I, it would be very difficult to explain case by case what the intensity and need is depending on the specific mm -hmm. age of the student presented within that data and the transition plan need. No, I understand that, but I guess my point is is that, you know, the stipended position, my understanding and how it's working this year is that the person has another full-time job within the district. Correct. And then is doing the stipend position on top of that. Correct. So. If you're telling me that of, of the pool of special education students, mm -hmm. of that 13%, that 60% of them fall in this range, mm -hmm. it seems like an impossible task. Mm -hmm. um, so it, that's, that's more of what I was getting at in terms sure. of the numbers. I mean, obviously, every, I mean, every special education student we have has an individualized plan for a reason. Right. So we, we can't get into that level of specificity and understanding how how many how many, how the needs are going to be but at the same time just to kind of ha evaluate whether or not a majority of our students fall in that area <clears throat> or not so. maybe it would help dr Wait. Zaleski if you explain that transition planning does not only happen by one individual yeah. right um, so it's a team approach sure and you have a lot of people I mean I think if you clarified the role of the chair sure you gave the example of now having full-time chairs right and your expectations as the director around transition planning um, and the role of your your special education chairs as well because it's not only left 
right. to one person getting a stipend to do transition plans. Right. So as you do that, can I just <coughs> question? So I know that you answered the question that the, the stipend in position is, is seeking that certification. Mm -hmm. Now, as you explain this team approach, I guess my question would also be, are other members of the staff, whether it be the team chairs or others, planning to seek that certification as no. well? No, no. Okay. So you don't have to have a certification to transition plan. Um, as stated, any child 14 and up is entitled to a transition plan by the person who's, who's responsible for the case, which really is the team chair. Um, and the Department of Education does not require that certification for that to happen. What is required is that you have a certified special educator or in the like role um, with like certification running their team meetings and offering that level of support. So our team chairs have different licenses. Psychology, one is a licensed psychologist, another is a licensed uh, moderate special needs teacher. So those licenses are all eligible licenses that DESE approves for someone to be in the role of a team chair. And then they're also approved by law to do the team, um, the transition planning. So that being said, it's a, it is a multi-team approach. Again, so a student may come to a team meeting, and again, it's, it's a team, so you have a lot of stakeholders at the team meeting, depending on the case of the student. The law is at every team meeting, you have to have a general education uh, teacher, as well as a special education teacher, as well as parent invite to the team meeting. Um, other members certainly show up. Related service providers, outside organizations, advocates show up at parents' requests. Parents have the opportunity to bring whomever they want to a team meeting. So oftentimes you'll have a team with, you may have a team with three people in the team chair, and you may have a team with ten people in the chair. All of those folks provide input, uh, are considered stakeholders, to provide input to the <coughs> transition planning process. And so what happens is a plan is developed at that time with input from various stakeholders, including outside physicians and, like I said, treatment organizations. <coughs> and then the team determines if the student's 14 and up, they're eligible by law to come to the meeting and be a voice as well. And we like that. We want students to be a voice in their, in their life, in their plan. So we encourage that. And then the plan is developed. So the work of the transition specialist, as I have it set up right now, the job description is, is available, but the work of the transition specialist primarily is not specifically to just develop the transition plan. The team is working on that constantly, is to do those tasks that cannot happen during the school day that we need to develop. For instance, going out into the community, working with organizations, and developing further and deeper connections with colleges, agencies, businesses to enhance the student's plan, making those level of connections. Within our population right now, I've charged our, our stipend transition specialist to begin working with the, the students that are 18 years old or, and, or just about turning 18 and going into our 18 to 22 program potentially or looking for outside opportunities, whether it's a college environment or a vocation, vocational environment. That's a very few select population of students that we're working on right now that have that very, very intense need. That's a different need than a high school student that's turning 18 and might need help with a college application. That can help. That can be taken care of at the team process through the team chair, even through the guidance counselor in some cases. Service. We have 13% population of students that are special education. That averages out to be about 450 students. Many of those students are serviced by guidance. The more intensive students are serviced very specifically by the team chair and they receive the support of the transition specialist to get that extra layer of support. So ideally, to grow the position, right now I need to assess within that intensive population, and you'll see later on when I talk about my out-of-district placements, I need to make sure that that transition specialist is able to make those connections and to average out from a data standpoint, is it effective or are kids continuing to go out elsewhere? And so before I put that position in place full time, I really need that data because we do have a full team working on transition planning constantly. So can I ask um, a follow-up question sure. related to the consultant that you brought in um, last year to work with the, the person who's going through the training but also with the team chairs. Are there other things like that in professional development that you have in place so that all of those mm -hmm. people are continuing to expand skills as they move forward? I am. So last year we had a consultant come in for a year-long opportunity and trained our staff and she um, gave us some recommendations and it was this is why we're at the place we're at right now. And so right now I've, I've been sending out um, 
uh, newly hired transition specialist, as well as our 18 to 22 coordinator. They're, they actually just went to a training a couple weeks ago. They have another training coming up I sent them to. Um, so as, tr as we get information and trainings, um, from the Department of Education, I'm sending them out whenever possible. The other great thing, and I'm glad you asked this, Jean, is um, Amanda Green is the transition connection through the Department of Education, and she dialogues directly with our staff who are working on transition as well. And um, our 18 to 22 coordinator has been meeting with me about her input and ideas, and she's been going to meetings with her, and also she's a contact for this district. So, and I've encouraged them to contact her to brainstorm how we can further <coughs> advance our students getting into the college setting, for instance. And how long is the certification program that we have somebody? So it's a two-year it's a two-year process. The car, the person I have in position right now, if he were to be hired as a full-time transition specialist, if we posted and hired him, um, is scheduled to be certified December of 2017. So next year at this time program would be complete and certification would be intact. Again, the, the programs out there that DESE put in place are so new that it would be hard pressed, I truly believe, if we po posted right now for 1.0 that we are going to get anybody certified yeah. for, that, for those reasons. I mean, I think this is my opinion. I think clearly this is something that's important to us as a district. We talked about it in yes. your hiring process yep. and um, I think it's a very positive move forward from what I understand from the state, but I also think there's a lot of value in um, staff who already has a great deal of familiarity with our individual students um, seeking that certification. And uh, when I was first, you know, reading this and hearing about this, I didn't realize the lightness of the pool, really. Mm. Um, and I, so I, I, I think that the focus, I, what I hear you saying is not no, but not yet yes and that you're moving forward to it and I think we all clearly are very invested in in moving this forward but I, I think uh, it sounds like you're you're taking a very careful data-driven approach to to it and it's and that's stressful because you know time is is shorter for those kids than it is for us in the long term as adults but um, but I, I thank you for all that extra information because to me listening to you now the, the work happening in this area is richer than I had the impression okay. before I came in. Thank you. Any other questions? Now that I sidelined your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I guess I, the, the, only, the only other, it's not so much a question, but maybe a request. So one of the things that I, I always, I think every year I do this, I get more focused on the, the things that we only do the budget once a year. And so we talk, we've done a better job, oh, of, I think, of talking about data throughout the year. <laughs> So um, if yes, I'm gonna, so so I guess if if there's a point later in the school year that we could get you talk about the ability to collect data, even if it's not related to the budget specifically, I think it would be good to have an update mm. on this since this is something when I mean, we talk in, in other functions about new programs and, and new focus areas and we look to see what the successes are and what we can learn and what we can change. So if that's something that we could do. And, and Karen know, has some of that for you here good. tonight. Yes. But, uh, I think I on do an ongoing basis, that's a great idea. Yeah, and I think it would be it would be good because right now our transition specialist is working with a handful of students, but even data on that handful of students would be critical just to help us understand here's some progress we're making, here's what we're doing with some transition planning. Here are the you know, we can't give details, but we could say here are opportunities we're providing by way of this. I also have written a grant and I'm waiting to see if it gets approved to support this work. That would be data mm -hmm. that we've got support to now to advance our opportunities for our students. Um, and I would love to come back and talk to you about that if that happens and all of the um, proposed components of that. I don't want to get everybody too excited yet. It's not approved. <laughs> so. yeah, that would be great. Thank okay. You. Okay, so my expense summary. Um, just summarize transportation. So there is an increase in the transportation costs. Mm -hmm. um, this is due to our obligations under our agreement with Accept Collaborative. Um, and as you, Dr. McLeod outlined next week, I am going to be presenting on how we're going to further enhance our collaboration with Accept Collaborative in the area of transportation. Um, so we have an increase in salaries. Um, it, basically, the increase is due to step scale base pay increases and then the new positions outlined in the, in the um, expense summary. Um, before you leave that, though, what's the, do we know, like, specifically, and Ralph, you may be able to speak to this, is, like, I know you'd hinted a couple weeks ago about the changes and accept and the potential budget implications. Sure. Um, what, 
what are the obligations that we have that are increasing this at such a well I can, I can just give you an idea uh, in FY 16 we were um, the we were expecting to transport 43 kids we actually transported 53 kids <clears throat> FY 17 they they expected to transport 48 students and they're actually transporting um, as of November 4th so now we know that we've added kids 52 and they're uh, projecting next year to be transporting 51 I think it's important that the committee <coughs> understands how the assessment model works in the past um, uh, schools were simply charged a per mile rate and the business managers and sped directors at accept and ultimately it was approved by the board of directors at accept looked at that model and said there are some basic inequities in that model because for example um, you have uh, a, you may have a student who's being transported uh, from Hopkinton to Boston now the number of miles is not really representative of the cost of that trip because at the time of day that that student's being transported at least in the morning it's right there in the middle of rush hour so there's going to be additional labor costs involved so what we did is we came up with an agreed upon matrix um, of charge for example a student who is transported within town is a 1.0 a student who's transported to a, to an accept program is a 2.0 all other schools if it's less than 10 miles it's 3.0 if it's less than 50 miles it's 3.5 and if it's greater than 50 miles it's 4.0 so what they do is they take our pool of students as of the end of October of this year they assign those values to each one of those students and they do that to all of the students that are being transported by by accept they come up with a grand total uh, of, of a factor and that factor gets assessed to each one of the member towns that is participating in the program now one of the interesting pieces just to give an example we and Natick have the same number of kids being transported this year our kids for our kids we're, we're paying next year because it's this year's kids that drives next year's four hundred and forty one thousand dollars Natick for the same number of kids is paying six hundred and ninety thousand dollars because their kids are more costly based upon the metric Matrix. because their kids are going <clears throat> greater distances uh, into non except schools so ultimately that's how it's determined so we budgeted a, a 20 I think I budgeted a 20 percent increase on the basis of the preliminary ridership that not only we had but that all the other districts had uh, as well Is because that formula disclosed to us though so like when you say we have a child that's assigned a 3.0 is that a multiplier of a base number that we're multiplying well what they do is they determine um, the the board of directors of accept um, projects a budget for the total costs of their program for transportation and it's that total budget that gets apportioned to um, to the various school districts that are participating based upon the number of matrix points that the, that the riders um, create are they nonprofit? Yes, they are a public entity that they are a, an educational collaborative uh, approved by the Department of Education they are we are they they are we <coughs> or us we. Okay. <laughs> we're members of accept they they in and of themselves are a public entity they yeah. fall under uh, the same regulations that uh, that we are so perhaps um, I 
know we've talked about you know concerns about transportation and about <coughs> the the contract etc and maybe this is something that we could bring to a future meeting to talk just about the accept yeah um, I was I was trying to figure out if there was like a simple <coughs> calculation that explained yeah, no. 133 it sounds no. like there isn't there so is if not. we want to have a future agenda yeah. item to talk about yeah the the way that this is calculated, I'd welcome it with sure. open arms and not try and waylay the presentation anymore. Yeah. I think but it's important to understand that um, no, we've, been, we've been using ACCEPT as our special ed uh, transporters for years, many, many years, probably longer than anybody in this room has lived in Hopkinton. Well, not lived here, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but... Um, Poor Jean. Yeah. So <laughs> the, the reason that, that except got into this business was at the behest <laughs> of the superintendents here, yeah. because there aren't a lot of private carriers out there yeah. or the private carriers that are out there charge so much money um, per run. So we pooled all of our business. There are 535 students that are transported by except. The biggest is Framingham. And so... Um, we're all in it together. I, I would suggest that we're the beneficiary of the fact that a town like Framingham is involved in it. They're almost half of the total ridership. So we pool our, uh, our resources as members of Accept, and we collaborate on, uh, on this. The business managers and the board of directors approve the budget for them. Okay. Thank you. So we, before we move on to supplies and services, I also want to mention that um, in Hopkinton, we're undergoing a pre-K program restructure. And with that program restructure, um, looking at the model with paraprofessionals to offer um, just a, a really integrated support model for students. And throughout the budget process and even continuing today and this week, we're <coughs> working very closely with consultancy services to examine that model. So I'm continuing discussions with Lauren um, this week and next week. So if the salary line item is any way impacted for FY18, and I'll have further information as we continue those discussions, that will be uh, presented uh, next week. If it is not going to have impact for FY18, and I don't specifically have all those details yet because we're still undergoing analysis, um, December 15th, if it has FY17 uh, impact, I would come to that meeting to discuss it. So I just wanted to be upfront with you about that in the event. Next week I am uh, presenting with Lauren and you're saying, geez, why didn't you bring that up? <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. And so as far as supplies and services go, um, last year Data Finch was in the technology budget. That's a data collection system we use for students with specialized need, uh, needs across the district. Um, so that's just now back in my budget. We appropriately placed it. Yeah. and. Contracted services um, has the decrease that you see up there. We, um, we have students with a lot of visual needs, and TVI is a teacher of visually impaired. And I recognized in analyzing my budget that we're spending a lot of money paying out to contracted services for this need. And when really when I analyze the numbers, it just makes sense for us to have a hired person. Um, so rather than putting the money into contracted services, if we have a hired person, that will eliminate us continuing to increase our contracted services budget line item. Okay. And that's uh, notable. I, I, so I found it myself, <coughs> Ralph. I didn't ask. That's a wash expense wise because the yep. TVI teacher is listed at 75 in the budget. That's right. So, I mean, not exactly a wash, but mm -hmm. you're talking about roughly the same cost to have a full time staff member in house. Yep. Yes, but it's right. But what happens when I analyze my budget is um, every year when I look at the trajectory, the uh, contracted services keeps growing. Right. No, I, it's, I'm saying I'm saying I'm saying that as a positive that it's a wash, right? Oh <laughs> yes, we're yes, getting somebody okay. in house for roughly the same money we're paying out to contracted services. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And so when I analyze that, I it just didn't make sense to keep paying contracted services. Okay. I just need to get back to my slide. I'm having a little technical difficulty here. So which contract would that position fall under? You mean union contract? Yeah. It's a good question. Because even is though... That a teacher? Oh, no. Is that a teacher contract? It would be a teacher. I don't know. <coughs> I don't know what a right. visually... In, I don't know if it's a teacher or not. Is it listed It's as a teacher contract. Yeah, it is a teacher contract. It's not a parent. It's a teacher contract. Nope. Yeah. Teacher contract. Yep. What are you doing? Oh, you're using the... All right. I was doing this. Mr. Hurt. Hi. 
Where is the offset for the um, contracted services that Dr. Zelsky was just talking about? <coughs> this line item. I see the 75000 for the TVI, but I don't know where the line item is. For the, for, the, for the actual salary of the individual? Well, the reduction in the contract services that the TBI would replace. It's on the first page of, of the, the budget sheet that has all the numbers on it. It's the last line item on that That's page. It. Thank you. Okay. I can't believe I found it that quickly. Oh, you're <laughs> just so you, good, Mr. Dumas. Just <laughs> can't okay. trick me. So are we ready to move on to tuitions? Sure. Okay. So we have a savings in the area of collaborative tuitions. Um, this primarily is due to student returns. So we returned a couple students to Hopkinton High School, so that's very exciting news. Um, there's been a decrease in circuit breaker funding available. So what happens is circuit breaking, we get refunded based on uh, the students' related services and where they're placed. So depending on what those services look like determines the amount of reimbursement. So that's the reason for the decrease there. Um, there is an increase in private school tuitions, and so the increase are primarily due to where we've placed students, the, the amount of students we've placed, and the rate increase of 2%. And I'm going to show you folks an outline um, of what that looks like so you have a, a clear understanding. So I just wanted to make a statement. The proper placement of students ensures student safety and provides adequate access to the curriculum in the correct environment, and really that's the goal. When when I make placement decisions with the team, we, we analyze student safety, student access to the curriculum, and then the correct environment for them to, to learn. So I just wanted to give you an outline. Um, I know this wasn't part of my you know, overall executive summary, but I felt this would be helpful. This is a five-year example of our collaborative school spending. So I came in FY, during FY16. So We've decreased it, and I, I, that's a good thing. Like I said, we've returned some students. Um, typically, when students are in collaboratives, just so you folks understand, collaborative is an extension of, of our district. And when students are in collaborative placements, that really is the step down into back into our district. So students can come back to district from private placement. But normally, when students are in private placement, it's more intensive than a collaborative environment. So you're more likely to have students returning from a collaborative environment quicker than from a private placement. So I just wanted to give you that outline to see how our spending has looked over the past five years. And I did the same for private school. So in FY16, when I came in, I analyzed the students that were placed f during the FY15 budget and worked very closely with our out of district coordinator to properly place students and bring students back where they needed to, which that's as you can see, is responsible for the decline. <coughs> in FY17, we put a couple of students out. And then in FY18, and I'm, I'm going to show you folks where we're at for you know next year, which is based on this year's decision making, why we're back up. Um, one of the things I want to um, state to you is students, we've had students move in over the past couple of years. And when students move in and they're placed, we are fiscally responsible for them already. So the work that we do as a team is we analyze the placement just to make sure it's adequate. Sometimes you can make decisions for different types of placements, but that's uh, you know an, an expense that the district incurs, and we have a responsibility to not disrupt the child's education. So I want to make you aware of that as well, because some of those numbers are responsible for move-ins, and I'm going to show you those numbers specifically. So here's an example, in obviously to protect um, student confidentiality. I did not put student names or identifying factors. I also didn't put exactly where the placements are because that could be an identifying factor. But in, our, in FY17, we have these students in collaborative placements. Um, these are you know, newly placed students. We have more than this overall. But this is an example for you folks to see the profile of the type of students that we're placing and why they're not serviced here in our district. So as you can see, th these students have significant mental health and behavioral issues. Um, some also have legal issues. The reason I put up their risk to self or others is these aren't your typical students who may struggle with some mental health issues that could be serviced by our school adjustment counselor or our psychologist. By the term significant, I mean by way of definition, is students that really 
pose a risk to themselves. They may struggle with some suicidal thoughts. They may struggle with um, getting into aggressive behaviors with others, causing potential for harm. And um, and it's not a one-time incident. Again, significant is defined as multifaceted with multiple outside providers involved. And usually when we come to it to make a decision about placing someone based on these factors, we have several outside treatment providers involved, sometimes um, law enforcement's involved as well, depending on the circumstance and the profile of the student. Um, student four was a move in, moved in with that history, and we, you know, we just kept the student in the placement. After examining the profile, we said it just did not make sense to have the student come here. Um, The, these are the students that we've returned. So just to kind of give you a little idea, as you know, certainly we put students out where they need to be, but we've also returned some students. So we have a student who's graduating, so that by default is, is no longer going to be a placement for us. Student two is, is a placement change. So when we have students in placements, like if they're in a private placement or even a collaborative placement, we examine um, if they're making progress and if we can change their placement, we do. So we did do that this year. As stated, we returned two students from Hopkinton to Hopkinton High School. Um, student five, we discharged. That was a team decision made based on what was taking place with the student to discharge the student from a placement. And student six, um, we also returned to Hopkinton High School. That was from a private placement. What's the difference between discharge and return? That's oh, that's a good question. Um, so a discharge is a decision that we make. Uh, Parents may come to the team meeting and they make a determination that they want the student to, let's say, go to a private school, not a private placement, mm -hmm. a private school, or they want a student to go to like a, a tech school, like Keefe Tech. Mm -hmm. So that would be, we would make a decision to discharge from a placement so they could present in one of those situations. They discharged from the placement, but they did not return to our did school. Did not return to our school, right. So the school yeah. is no longer no responsible. Longer responsible for for right, we're situation. no longer responsible for that situation, right. So, and again, without, I don't want to violate confidentiality, but so I've given you more than one scenario, could be a placement <coughs> at yeah. any one of those situations. And just to reinforce your earlier statement, Karen, it looks like student two would be a student that was returning from a more intensive environment to a less intense. This could be a stepping stone to eventually coming back to the district? Yep. So this particular um, situation, again, without violating confidentiality, but this was a really strategic decision um, to help the student. This is a student who's just about ready to come back. Yeah. So and for us to give stone. this person the opportunity um, <laughs> this person actually is not just an participating in the collaborative, but is actually participating in some events and things here in our district yeah. um, because we're starting to make the transition back to our, yeah, our those program. Are, those are really yep. interesting. So, so again, so like I said, you have a, you know, a variety of, of scenarios, um, and sometimes discharges too can take place if, if parents put the children somewhere else, um, in a, in a, and it could be a private placement that we are not responsible for, but it's a team decision to do so. So... So there's all different scenarios we're working on, and Connie, our Ida District co Coordinator, really is doing a fantastic job. She's out there analyzing the students um, on a weekly basis. She's traveling to all the different placements, working with um, treating providers, and then her and I meet every other week in a team meeting setting, but also we uh, conference weekly on our students, their progress, and what can we do to help them keep connections with our district, regardless of where you're placed, because all students, and I want to remind you, whether they're in collaborative or private placements, belong to us. They are part of our district, and I constantly remind the students, as does Connie, that you are still ours. We care about you. We want you to have supports. We're here for you, and, and ideally, we'd like you to come back. And so we keep those connections going with the students and families in those placements so they know they have a connection to us. So the, can I ask that the students that have been discharged and are potentially at a private school, that, that is the responsibility of the parents, if the parents then make the decision that they want the student to be back involved in the Hopkinton School District, that's also still available to them at any time. Oh, of course. Yes. Yep. If a, par if a, if a <laughs> child moves out of the district, we have, you know, there are some students in our district that are attending private schools. Could be Holy Name, St. Mary's, or it could be a private placement, let's say, that the parents unilaterally are pay paying for. If the parents say, geez, you know, I really feel like it's time. I want the team to help me. I, I want this child to come back. Um, if, there, if it's not a private situation where it requires IEP team intervention, let's say they're in like St. John's, they just want to come back to high school, that's just a matter of enrolling. If it's um, they're in a different private place that the parents are paying for, because that was a choice that they made with privately with the organization, and they say, geez, I want to come back, we want to have them in our school, 
our team would analyze currently what's taking place with the child, clinically what's taking place with the child. We look at previous IEP and data, and then we make a good informed decision with the parent as to the best placement setting to make sure that coming back is going to is going to work. We don't want to we don't want to prematurely have put students back either because we want them to be successful. Um, but usually, parents, in my experience, when they are coming to that place, they're coming to that place of deciding to put them back because they're real confident the student's doing really well. That's usually my experience. So just to give you the profile of students in the uh, private placements, so you have students that have, mul you know, could be situations, and this is a situation of ours, um, it has multiple disabilities, um, re you know, resulting in needing a highly specialized setting. Um, this, uh, as you see, I use the term in, on this page, psychiatric, not just social, emotional, behavioral. So the reason I use that term is typically um, our students that are in these placements due to psychiatric impairments, it's um, pretty significant. They could be uh, experiencing psychosis. They could have a, a history of multiple hospitalizations and have an inability to function in a whole school environment. Um, the risks are, are very intense. They usually need um, a highly specialized team of, of providers working with them, So, and usually in a very small setting. As you see, student three and four moved in. One was very <coughs> medical, and uh, one was very psychiatric. And so the move-ins, like I said, when students move in and they're already in placements, we, we have to put them back. In those particular move-in cases, um, they had just moved in. One, one moved in and was already in a placement. One was not, but we placed them based on the profile of the student. Um, so these, these are students that definitely are where they need to be. And I have to tell you, like I said, Connie, my out of district coordinator, does ass assesses these kids on a weekly basis. Some of those students are are still struggling and, and needing some support and uh, getting the help that they need, which we're grateful that they're in the environment they are in to get the help that they need. Um, some are actually making really great gains because they're they're stabilizing. Usually, when children are in an environment like that, too, they're working with their outside providers also to stabilize, maybe with medications and other things that we can't necessarily manage here in the in the school setting. Now, these aren't hospital settings, but they are intensive private settings that have access to clinicians throughout the day to constantly dialogue with treatment providers as they see symptomology arise. Um, so I just wanted to give you an understanding <coughs> of, of our decision making around placement and, and how we came to that determination this year when we were making the decisions to put the students where they needed to be to get access to the education and be successful. So one thing I want to point out is um, providing adequate intervention this year also resulted in a restraint reduction by 100% in FY17 in Hopkinton. And this is really great news. Um, you know, what we did to help support this and change our model so that students were receiving support in the, the settings that they needed to receive them in, 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 including here in Hopkinton in some cases. So we changed the behavioral model to include more social emotional support and involvement for all students. So when students struggle with the crisis, we pull in the whole team of psychologists, school adjustment counselors, and behavior analysts and look at it from a whole school approach, a whole child approach, really, to determine the best interventions. And that's been incredibly helpful because we've had a better opportunity to assess. And Karen, just to put in a plug for, you know, the, the adjustment counselor at the Hopkins School. Um, oh, that was my favorite slide. I know. What happened to me? I don't know. I show cleft. Um, <laughs> you, you probably have it in front of you to summarize anyway, Karen, but I, I think what's important to reinforce with respect to budget decisions is that last year Karen requested an adjustment counselor at the Hopkins School that they had identified a need, um, and Vanessa will speak about that next week, but just how successful that has been is that in addition to all of these things that Karen's talking about, appropriate placements, appropriate training, social-emotional support through adjustment counselors, and others, um, and then yeah, thank you. Keep going with your um, de-escalation. Yep. So, you know, there's also been an increase in accountability and reporting requirements. So when you know if children are being restrained or there's a situation that involves a restraint, you can fill out paperwork and, and submit it. Last year, as you know, Kathy and I worked very closely to uh, train the staff in de-escalation and safety care training. One of the things that we emphasized was 
there's a reporting structure where they need to let <coughs> both myself know and Dr. McLeod know exactly the precipitants. Mm -hmm. What was the precipitant to the restraint? What techniques did we try prior to try and de-escalate the restraint? I, on many occasions, went down to the building level when I saw a report come through last year to sit with folks and say, help me understand, why didn't we try this instead of this? I think this could have prevented if we did this. That level of dialogue was very helpful in, in helping staff brainstorm other strategies so we avoid restraint. Um, and then the proper placement of students. Some of these students um, really needed a lot of support, and I, I truly believe that the repeated restraints was because they weren't receiving the treatment that they needed in the right setting, the education and the services. So just to give you a little tidbit of data, last year we had 25 restraints for seven students. That's a lot of restraints for seven students. Um, and this year we had zero. And so part of that is all of the factors that we talked about, just providing different interventions, providing opportunities for students to be placed where they need to be placed to be safe and to access the curriculum. So I welcome any questions or feedback. I, I have a, and I don't actually know, apologize if this is for you or Mr. Dumas, but uh, I was looking at the um, circuit breaker flow. Um, <coughs> and I, I apologize, I did not ask this earlier today when we spoke. Um, so if you don't have the answer, you can get back to me. So for FY17, we came in at, th at 395 for revenue. Yes. Where was that versus what we budgeted? Um, well, we didn't quite budget it that way, John. What we did is we knew that we had um, a balance that was going to be left over at the end of the year. Right. And we estimated what, what the new number would be. And I think we're pretty close, actually. Okay. But the, the combination of those two numbers was $700,000, right. which is what we agreed to commit. I, I don't have what we oh because we're we not collected. because we're not sort of doing the in out right. direct we didn't we didn't put the budget no, revenue number for like this what we expected for circuit breaker because yeah. we just expected that we would get at least one hundred and forty thousand yeah. to be able to pay okay so that makes sense uh, what I can do and I thought about doing this uh, later this afternoon was go back a few years to show you what we took in versus what we used to reduce the budget. Uh, so we knew that we weren't going to take $700,000 right. in, but we had that available from uh, prior year um, balances. Because we can carry that over from one year to the next. If you do that, could you also, would it be easy to trend the, as part of that, trend the um, reimbursement percentages? Yeah, I already have that information. Okay. Yeah, okay. you and I talked, I think, a couple of weeks ago, and I thought I had budgeted 70% for next year. Yes, yeah, so 65. And I right. actually budgeted at 65. Which is sort of lower than it's been the past couple of years, which yeah. is why we, I like budgeting it that way. Yeah, but. we got 70 this year. Yeah. Subject okay. to any 9C cuts, but right. I don't think they, you, they haven't been hitting that. No. Um, they hit it once in the whole uh, history of the program. Right. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Mr. Rare, any questions? General questions? Sure. Um, the only thing I saw of interest was there was an increase in the middle school nurse salary line of about 50K. Is that just the numbers thing? No. Karen can no, answer. I can certainly answer that. So I requested an increase of a 0.5 nurse at the middle school. So the nurse currently at our middle school is servicing many students with um, treatment plans that require intensive care. So uh, again, without violating student co confidentiality, but just for instance, uh, students may need catheters, they may need uh, diabetic checks, <coughs> they uh, may need monitoring throughout the day. So there's a, a, st a state ratio that you utilize for amount of that type of student to nursing, and we're over that ratio. So in the interest of medical <coughs> safety, I'm requesting a 0.5 nurse for the middle school to help stabilize that situation. Okay. Well, do we expect that with those students moving up that that nursing is going to have to follow? To the high school, you mean when the yeah. students move through the district? 
So we will have to assess. So for next year, this is the need. But I definitely will have to assess with my nursing staff for the following year based on how many students and then the profiles of those students and if they're still in district or if they've stabilized medically, what the need would be. And that's, that's how we would look at that. Can I ask a couple more? Oh, absolutely. Mr. Uh, I see where there's a reduction in other instructional materials. Between 17 and 18, just $3,000 to $300. Mm -hmm. Are you okay with that? Is that? Yes, I mean. Is that, is that a pain point? No, I just need to know what line you're looking at in terms of. Um, what's it called? <coughs> other other instructional. instructional. Let me just see where you are. Oh, yeah, she should be in number. Oh, she's up at uh, 2415. Yeah, 2415. It's all of the supplies at the various schools. I, I am okay with it. I just need to find the line, but let me tell you my rationale. Uh, so instructional supplies and materials, I put the money into the budget that I feel we definitely need. But the reduction, I write grants, so I have um, some grant funding to support some supplies and materials. Um, particularly, the 262 grant is offsetting right now our pre-K and center school supplies and materials, and that helps provide the offset and the reduction in the budget. So um, not seeing a lot of other st stuff jump out, at me anyway, <coughs> most, most of this is very new to me. Are there other points or other pain points in this budget that you worry about? You don't have the funding that you need? Um, not for this budget. I mean, I felt real confident with this budget. I feel like this budget, you know, during the budget process, Dr. McLeod has us work with all of our stakeholders in our department, and this budget was developed. Um, primarily, I worked with our team chairs to get me information from the building levels in terms of the need for each building. And we felt confident as a group when we came together that this budget, particularly with the staffing, supports our, our need. Um, the only thing I'm continuing to analyze, as I mentioned earlier in this budget presentation, is the pre-K structure. And so if that were a worry point, I, worry is really not the right term, but it's definitely a further analysis point that I may need to come back to the committee to discuss. So that probably would be the point, I would say, is something that needs further discussion if needed. And that's going to be learned in the next week or so? Yes. Okay. Next week. Mr. Hur, there's also, this is a moving target with special education, and we all know that, that there are so many unpredictable things mm -hmm. that can happen between now and, and the fall. Um, that the ability to prepay sped at the end of our budget is really an important thing for us as we work around this because the unexpected things that Karen will come to the school committee and ask for approval on uh, because they were unexpected paraprofessional support for example she frequently will come um, to to add those on now when the need has not been established really doesn't make a lot of sense mm -hmm. but this is one area where we know that we can come even after the budget has been finalized and we're into FY18 to access funds. Um, and that provides section. some security um, okay. around the budget planning. And, and you'll see, and yeah, you see that in that table at the beginning, and then that's the other reason why you see us guard that circuit breaker account so judiciously because in a lot of cases that's where between the f approval of the budget and the needs, yes. that's where that money's going to come from. I've heard the defense of that circuit breaker before, and now I know why. So there you go. And that's why we pay prepay special ed. That's why we like having your balances, okay. so that we have a little oh, bit. Oh, right. So and we can absorb this. All right. Yeah, our summer meetings, for those that aren't following very closely, there's often the discussion of whether or not we're prepaying transportation costs with accept because of the fact that we may have unanticipated needs coming in. So those are all part of our insurance, so to speak. Um, I just, someone just mentioned something that Dr. McLeod made me question, and this is totally an aside and you don't have to answer right now, mm -hmm. but just like so that you and I can talk about okay. it another time or put it on an agenda item. But with the new school building, mm -hmm. is there plans for an in increased pre-K program? Like are there more classrooms or? So that's a really great question for if we can wait until okay. next week. Absolutely. I just Because there's going to be a whole presentation between um, Lauren and Karen, and that has come up as part of the work that they've been doing with Dorsey Yearling this mm -hmm. year, a consultant um, who's been analyzing our pre-K program. They have all, they've come up with recommendations. We're really excited about it. And it does, it does affect 
um, the new building. So if we can, you know, keep people on the edge of their seats mm. for next mm -hmm. week, they'll come out. And then you'll come. Now we'll come. Okay, thank right? you. Yeah, no, that's fine. As long as I, yeah, I need to get it out. So <laughs> yeah. um, but I don't also want to usurp Mr. Hur. If you have more questions, or of course, Mr. Manning, you're more than welcome to ask anything that you may have. I think you're doing great work. Thank you. It's all good. Thanks. Thank so, you. No, I don't have any questions either on this. I know every year it's a moving target that has changed, so um, Thank you. Can't, can't question. Thank you. <laughs> No, but I appreciate Dr. Zaleski the fact that um, last year's budget was was your first one with the district, and I think I, we as a committee had a hard time completely following all the different areas. So I feel like this year it's been much more succinct and and easy to transcribe between what the services are and what the spend is. So um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much thank you. with yes, the adjustments. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you very and much. And thank you for letting us know. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Great. I guess we're moving on to curriculum and professional development. Oh, look at you. Okay. You're yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so this is also my inaugural uh, budget <laughs> with the with the district. Uh, and despite the fact that special education is very complicated, I think mine is far less complex. There are a couple of things that have um, sort of stood out in my budget as places where um, we do need to make some increases. And so I'm hoping that this very brief presentation will highlight those things for you. Um, the two areas of the budget that I cover are professional development and curriculum leadership. So in the professional development budget, on the slide you can see that we have a 5.4 increase, but what that really amounts to is only a $10,000 increase because the budget itself is, is actually so low. Um, and that really comes as a result of course reimbursement. So when the teachers go out and they take courses to better themselves professionally and increase their instructional repertoires, um, what, what happens is they submit paperwork to the district so that they can be reimbursed for those courses. Um, each teacher is entitled to up to $1,000 in course reimbursement. If you are a teacher who doesn't have professional teacher status, you have $1,000 plus an additional 250 <coughs> And so even though there's a teacher cap, there is no district cap. And so what we've been finding is that year by year, that dollar amount is going up incrementally. And maybe that comes as a result of just having newer and younger teachers in the district who are you know, working toward different degrees and degree status. Um, but we did decide to budget an extra $10,000 because we had been sort of under budgeted in years past. And Mr. Dumas can speak to that as well. Yeah, the FY17 actual, and we know what that number is because it's finalized now is almost a hundred thirty thousand bucks and we budgeted 80 so that's kind of um, result in a budget transfer but 130 is a hundred and thirty is an outlier it is okay it is. that's why I didn't uh, request an increase to 130 right. okay but I felt as though some increase was yeah that uh, makes sense was called for okay and so that's really the only sort of blip on the professional development screen. So I will move to curriculum leadership. There are two areas of growth in curriculum leadership. And the first comes with our English language learners and that student population in the district. So you can see how the student population has grown from 2013 to 2017. Uh, we have had in the last couple of years a 17 student increase each year. Now, one of the things that we have to be careful of, we could have had 30 students move into the district who are L's, but what happened is probably that 13 students were released from the program because their English proficiency allowed them to exit. One of the concerns that we have this year is that um, the state has taken the L standards and raised them a little bit. And what they've also done with the WIDA and access testing is they have raised the scale for release from the program. So we are anticipating that we may not lose any students from the program at the end of the 17 school year. Um, they were estimating that they were about one point inflated uh, last year, and typically students will raise that much in a year. But if they're not going to allow those students who raise one point to exit uh, because of that inflation, we're probably going to keep that number of 86 that you see on the screen. 
And so if an additional 30 kids move into the district and very few, if any, are exiting, we are estimating that we're going to be probably well over 100 students next year. So we believe that we are going to need one more FTE to service our English language learners in FY18. Now with the new standard, it, so I understand the, the not graduating piece, but will there be any kicking back that, sh you know, like, uh, that you would be assessing and all of a sudden they now are not meeting what the new standard is? So yes, the access levels range from one to six and those fall into different categories. For example, speeding, speaking, listening, reading, writing. And our concern really is that we might have had a student who was a level four writer last year who may still be a level four writer this year despite you know intensive instruction or may even drop to a level three. Um, area we don't really anticipate much in the way of dropping but we don't really anticipate students reaching the new levels to exit the program as well and is Can there I, in, is there um, is there uh, any kind of greater percentage of, of languages that you're experiencing with the students that are in the word English isn't the first language like is it predominantly Spanish predominantly Chinese or is it all over the board it's really all over the board I think um, you know, being in public education, you know, 20 years ago, very often kids came to us from Spanish-speaking countries. But now we get students from all over the world, really. Um, I can get you those kind of demographics know, if you're interested. It's just more of just interest, cause, yeah, because I mean, yeah. for some, in, in some instances, it's also uh, very enriching for the other students too, mm -hmm. to have that other cultural aspect. But I mean, understanding that it's a great difficulty for the student themselves in terms of learning. So. Yeah. What I wanted Dr. Kavanaugh to clarify for, yes. for, for the school committee was when we talk about those levels of instruction, the levels of instruction are also matched to a requirement around the numbers of minutes of instruction. Could you speak to that? Certainly. So students who fall in those lower tiers of WIDA levels, they're entitled to 90 minutes of instruction as opposed to the kids who are in the higher levels. They are um, afforded only 45 minutes of, of instruction uh, per day. So I know it's, it's an astounding amount of, of time that kids, that kids are getting. So what ends up happening also is that um, if Ralph, for example, were a level six and Dr. McLeod was a level two, we would not be able to put them into the same grouping academically. So when we're looking at kids in first grade and second grade and trying to group children, um, sometimes we come up with groups of six and sometimes we come up with groups of two because there are so many mandates around the way we are able to group children for pull-out services and we have a student at the high school who's a group of one we do so we also have um, a student at the high school who is um, a SLIFE student and what SLIFE means is that a student has had um, limited or interrupted formal um, education and so when that happens um, they have to have pretty intensive services because um, sometimes they haven't even gotten basic literacy skills in an original language so if they can speak and listen in a language but they don't read and write in that language then reading and writing becomes very difficult in english because they don't have transferable skills yeah. you have a breakdown of the the grades or the predominantly is this kindergarten to first grade or what's the what's the percentage fortunately in Hopkinton most of the students come to us in the primary and intermediate grades so they are kids who come to us k1 to three and so they are able to exit the program long before you know they hit middle school um, I think in the middle school we may have four students right now we have one student who is a SLIFE and some international students who are at the high school so the kids who come to us from international programs are also uh, allowed by law to get L services. This is the, these are the yeah, F1 are these students? Are... Yeah. Okay. Uh, I I'm, apologize because I think I'm going back over something you explained, but I just want to confirm my understanding. So <laughs> 17 EL students per year to the past two years is a net number. Correct. So, okay. Yes. Thank you. All right, and that's just a, a graphic that will show you sort of the trajectory of our increased L population. Do our, Ralph, do our F1 visa fees account for the required uh, spend that we have in terms of those services? Well, they're currently paying, I think, $14,000 uh, to come here, which is, uh, I think, a bit higher than our per pupil cost yes. on the average. Um, they're certainly 
is not a, an upcharge for L services. I actually didn't even know that that they get L services. Yeah. We don't direct. We don't. I mean, no. we use the F1 money for var offset various programs, but yeah. that's not one of them. That's correct. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And no, just to I be just clear, was more wondering if it was taken into account in the calculation of the F1 visa fees. You know, that's what I was more getting at. So. No. And to be clear, also, a lot of the international students will decline those services because they much rather be in, you know, science, social studies, English, mm -hmm. math classes than, you know, in, in a language-based class. And so the other sort of big ticket item in the curriculum budget uh, comes with the new science texts. And so uh, in January of 2016, the state adopted the new science standards. We had been waiting a very long time for this. I think in previous budgets, you probably heard that the, the middle school wanted to do textbook analysis and um, go through that whole process of evaluating textbooks and then adopting a new one. And they keep putting it off and keep putting it off because they didn't want to adopt a new textbook until the new standards were adopted. And so they have been. So what we really need to do is get textbooks for grades five through eight, because as uh, Mr. Dumas had said at the beginning of this meeting, grade four will be purchased through the FY17 budget. So the middle school wants to do an incremental adoption, meaning that they will in FY18, get new sixth grade books. In FY19, get new seventh grade books. And in FY20, get new eighth grade books. And so that will happen over a three year period. So what we're anticipating is that in FY18, we will have to buy textbooks for grades five and six for science to align with the new standards. And the only thing I've put on that slide is what Desi tells us that we can do, and they are really very wide open about the kinds of uh, resources that we purchase in district. I think one of you had a question about future um, curriculum. I didn't know if we were there yet. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I, I, we're on questions. I have two that are related to this. Um, and I was smiling when you were talking about the science textbook curriculum because I think every budget I've been involved with, including when I was sitting with Mr. Manning over there in appropriation, we've been talking about these science standards. So the fact that they're actually finally here is Amazing. interesting. Um, but um, the two questions I have are, first of all, Mr. Dumas, so we offset a significant amount the past couple of years with the F-1 visa revolver. Yeah, unfortunately, that's not available. Oh, because we're, we're using it somewhere else. Well, we're using it for the high school. Okay, so we'll see that instructional next week. staff. Okay, yeah. um, and then um, so then the, the, my more general question is so the, so you you outlined a little bit how some of the science uh, costs are going to be multi-year. Um, programmatically speaking, though, if we're looking ahead to FY19, do we have another curriculum update coming that's going to be sort of this size ticket item? The only thing that Desi tells us that they're looking at changing are social studies standards. Mm -hmm. And what I would anticipate is that um, if we look at something like Hopkins School, I don't think that they are basing a lot of their instruction through a textbook, per se. Um, and sometimes what that means is that, you know, the American Revolution will leave grade three and leave grade five and get married into grade four or those kinds of things. So I feel like there may be good curriculum materials already in district that could be restructured with uh, social studies. Um, and then typically, you know, high school is high school. Right. You know, so. But what about a, a, any of sort of <clears throat> internal uh, updates? So maybe not DESE driven, but... Part we of our need to do a, plan, I was thinking. Yeah, a curriculum oh, review of, of a program or anything like that. And if you don't have the answer now, that's... Yeah, I don't really. There's nothing that I can see foresee immediately, but I would be happy to, you know, investigate that for you. Okay. Just tell me okay. Can I ask a couple no. questions? <laughs> um, on the, the um, ELL budget increase, I think in one place I, I saw that it was $77,000 for the new personnel request yes. form, mm -hmm. but then on the budget spreadsheet, it's $128,000. Did we add staff this year that that's, no? No. I'm glad you asked that. I think Brian brought that up last week, and I there was no way I could come up with that information because I wasn't ready for it. Um, <coughs> but um, let me just give you an, an idea of what's going on there. The FY17 budget 
was $405,000 for five people. Um, the cost for five people in FY17 actual is $420,000. They're not the same five people. We had some people leave who weren't making so much money. Unfortunately, these are difficult positions to fill, and they were filled with people who made more money. Now, next year, the people that are making $420,000 now are anticipated to make $455,000 next year. Because of the five, three of them get steps, all five of them get the 2.5% raise, and four of them are anticipating lane changes. Okay. So that gets you to 455 before you add a $78,000 um, salary. And the reason it's a 78000 salary instead of a standard master's five or, yeah. is because the teacher has actually been identified from within the system um, as a transfer. Oh, good, okay. Um, all right, thank you. And then um, the Mandarin into, into the middle school. Um, are we not paying the Mandarin out of the F-1 visa anymore? The, uh, unfortunately, the F-1 visa money has been tapped into over the years, um, and um, I'll be happy to pull together an analysis of that for you. Okay as to why I couldn't recommend um, using the money. I'll have that ready for next week. Okay, that's fine. I, I mean, it was just my... I think it's all at the high school, though. Yeah, right? it's all at the high school. All the F1. Yeah, yeah no, it definitely is. I just... Yeah. That was the original intent, and I didn't know if there was enough there that we could... Share a teacher or something. Yeah, yeah or yeah. support this one particular expense. I just thought I might have found you some money, but yeah, I <laughs> you're ahead of me as always. No, the, the yep. original intent of the F1 visa money, Gene, was to expand it into the middle school. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, it was to develop the uh, the Mandarin Chinese program, um, and so we one of the one of the use one of the anticipated uses of the money was to be able to, and it has paid for the Mandarin teacher. We had grants for two years. Um, and during that time, we were able to collect the F1 uh, money, and then by the third year, we were able to afford a teacher and I see. the textbooks and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I'll bring that for, okay, for the thank you. Can I, next week. Can I sort of build on that request? Is it possible? I know at some point in these discussions, we always get to revolving accounts. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible to get a, a collated summary of the revolving account funds and where they're sure. all going? That would be helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Can I bring that with me to the meeting as opposed to out in the packet? Sure. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? So um, it's becoming obvious to me sitting here tonight, maybe a little bit. Maybe you're seeing this too, Mike. I don't know. But we're working off of FY16 actual FY17 budget and then proposed FY18 budget and a lot of the differentials are between FY17 budget and FY18 budget request and there's a lot of moving parts that you guys have mm -hmm. that we're not going to know for several more months so guilty as charged pushing earlier budget discussions to try and get this wrapped up before the night of town meeting or the night before town meeting <coughs> But I can see how we're creating a little bit of a challenge for ourselves and really nailing this down. Um, I think we can explain it as we go through the process to the community, but it's becoming a little bit more obvious to me one of the concerns that you guys had. So I'll, I'll chat with Mr. Kamalo about that too. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate you bringing that up too, and I think it also speaks to, we talked about the mm -hmm. summer meeting and the end of year balances, but I think we often get questions f about the budget transfers that go on throughout the year and that this is, you're seeing a large part of it. Yeah. You know, the the, mm -hmm. the administrative staff is doing their best in terms of predicting, but needs change as we go and we have to make some smart shifts. Yeah, and Carol, this is not meant by, <clears throat> because of your presentation of everything blowing up my little brain over here. but. Um, just in general, it's kind of really sort of coming into focus for me. Um, so we got to work on that, I think. I'm not sure what the answer is necessarily for coming years, but I can see. Because it also goes to the, f the free cash thing, right? So we look at it.
from a free cash perspective and where's the free cash in the, in, in the overall town budget and when do we access that and how do we access that and where do we apply that uh, in future years and can we apply it to the next budget year and, and that kind of I think this messes up that thinking a little bit or at least clouds that approach and that could be problematic too. I think in addition to what you've seen so far Brian what a significant significant and additional thing that the school committee and yourselves will see next week is how the programs that have been approved over the past several years and implemented in the schools have resulted in um, performance and so this is a request that the school committee had made that that I think it was a great one when Dr. Kavanaugh did her presentation back at the beginning of November I think on performance was here we're telling the district performance story why don't you bring that evidence when you're talking budget um, and that's what you can expect um, next week um, not only the individual principals um, much like Karen's presentation tonight talking about their individual budgets but then working with Carol to connect that with with achievement and improvements that we've seen across the district with direct directly um, aligned with some of the programs that we've put in place so what it makes me think of when I listen to you is that I think the strategic decisions that have been made around things that we're keeping and things that we are no longer keeping have happened all along with that in mind with that end in mind which is how can we continue with, how can we um, experience continuous improvement and how can we no longer do the things that are really not helping in that regard um, so there's been a lot of programmatic changes um, that we're really excited uh, to be able to share next week. Does okay. the professional development budget impact uh, the metrics used uh, in the Commonwealth uh, as, as schools are graded, if you will, um, by the various associations that do these things? In other words, the fact that we spend money on professional development, does that help the district? I'm sure it does. No question there, but does it help the district in the metrics world too when you get Hopkinton in the top 20 schools and, and so sort of, you know that kind of thing? Are you saying like is it a factor yeah. that they evaluate? Yeah, I don't believe that it impacts a district's ranking, but they do report a per pupil mm -hmm. expenditure for professional development on the DESE website for every city and town in Massachusetts. Um, so you know it, it does show there that Hopkinton is a place where you are deeply invested in the professional development of your teachers. But I think what I also wanted to add to what Dr. McLeod you had mentioned just a minute ago, it, it was a direct question by the Board of Selectmen to the school committee during our budget message joint meeting that we had in October to demonstrate um, where some of these strategic initiatives that we've spent an enormous amount of money on mm -hmm. in past years, mm -hmm. how that is translating mm -hmm. um, to both student growth within the district mm -hmm. and also what we've talked about here many times is that the potential to lower costs, especially on the special education side yeah. of the budget going forward um, because of being able to deal with issues at an earlier age that you may be able to help extinguish that if they were left untreated or untaught mm -hmm. would fester into larger problems at the older grades. So um, so I think that presentation next week will help reinforce that a lot of those decisions while were investments at the time and no one was entirely sure that those were going to be worthwhile will show what the worth was at that time and then also demonstrate to us why we need to maintain them going forward. Yes, a little snippet of that just today when we met with the elementary leadership team and Lauren um, told us that they've gone from two co-taught classrooms in first grade to one um, and that's in two years. So that's a direct Im impact of full day kindergarten, absolutely. Um, and, and I can't stress enough the importance of what Karen said tonight about restraint because when there were the kinds of restraints that were going on in the dis district last year the impact that had on the entire functioning of a building was significant and it meant that administrators weren't able to be doing what they were need to be doing it meant it impacted 
numerous teachers whose entire day could be. Um, and so when you have those kinds of things happening and the fact that the improvements have happened so that we're now at <coughs> zero, that's astounding. And that's a programmatic change that has resulted in a better experience for all kids and less interruption to the school day for, for all kids. Um, and those are the kinds of things that, that I, I think are really important to be called out and, and really understood. It's not a small thing to have zero restraints. It's, it's, a, it's astounding. So, um, any other questions? Mr. Manning, yes. So I guess this was a night of hearing about, you know, how we have to spend more money on the special education, <clears throat> SPED, and in, um, English language learners. And we also mixed in there adding um, Mandarin into the eighth grade, you know, in the terms of what we have to have versus what is nice to have. Um, can you explain a little more why do we have to have this year when we have such tight constraints on what we want the overall budget to be, why, why this year to, to add Mandarin in the middle school? Can I, may I <clears throat> just begin to answer that question? That is, that is a question that we <coughs> ask ourselves through this entire process. And I think we'll be at a better place to, for the committee to be weighing in on that question after next week's presentation. So I don't mean to be putting everything off to next week, but because you're going to hear a presentation, you're going to hear where increases are being requested at the school level and where no increases at all are being requested. Um, and we are very much going to be looking at that very question um, because it, it could be a nice to have at, at this time. Um, it's also something that has been you know, we've been wanting to increase foreign language at the sixth grade um, and build the Mandarin program for years and years and years. So it's such a difficult um, decision, but it has to be made within within the, the, the entire budget percent increase. And, um, you know, we went through all of this last year in detail when we were really seeking to increase foreign language, French, I think it was French, right, in sixth grade, mm -hmm. and bring it on as, yeah. Yes. Um, and then in the end could not, it was a difficult decision that we really could not recommend. So um, that is one of the things that always ends up being, in the end, a very important consideration for all of us to make. Didn't mean to ask the question before we were ready to Yeah, no, it. no, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's something that, that jumps out for people. It's a challenge to this, to this process, right, because some of these pieces are in different budgets, even though next week when the principals come, they're going to talk about what is sort of the, the program at each school. And so, I mean, I think when I met with uh, Dr. McLeod and Mr. Dumas to ask some of my questions today, it's the exact same thing that happened. It's, it's unless we just devoted a day to it, it's difficult to knit it all together at once. So, absolutely. Any other questions? Thank you very much for um, the participation because it does help us think about different areas of the budget as well. Because we, I can get very singular focused because we hear it more often. So it's it's helpful for me to have the other perspective there. Um, any other committee members have any questions? All right, then we are wrapping up the budget portion for our uh, evening. Thank you for again for joining us. Good night. Good night. Um, Screensaver? Mr. Herc? I've been hanging for like five more minutes. I'm sorry, what? There might saver? be a question yeah. that comes up on our next agenda topic. Um, that no, we have <coughs> our. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Business yeah. The issue chairs. HCA parking agreement. Oh. Right? <laughs> so um, we're moving on to finish up our new business um, the HCA parking agreement, letter B. Um, I believe. You all should have had a copy in our agenda materials. Dr. McLeod can definitely speak to some of the iterations that she's experienced over the last couple of months. Um, town Council's been involved. I had a review of it. I want to make sure that it got what, and that's why I printed this, Lori, the ors and the ands. So sorry, I should not jump right to the detail. <laughs> um, I'll give a little bit of an overview. So I've been meeting um, with, with this leadership from the HCA to try to work out an agreement around parking. Um, there was a very outdated parking agreement and then when this was brought up in the context of a liquor license, um, I, one of the, one of the um, results of that discussion was we need to take another look at the parking agreement. 
Um, something that I felt very strongly about was police presence um, in the parking lot when there was an event that included alcohol and also clearly marking off the area. Um, we've talked about lighting concerns at that end of the parking lot. It can be very dark. Um, it's been really great working with Kelly and um, Chris. Kelly and Chris. <laughs> It's, it's been, they're very appreciative. Um, I, I feel uh, as a representative to the school committee in this regard, um, that this is, this is an example of working with across departments and with other organizations within the town to, to support things that are happening that are really great for the town. I mean, so it's been, a, it's a, been a pleasure working with them. Um, obviously the approach has been safety and Lori, here you had a comment. So this did go to Ray, and he he took the original document and put it in this format. And then Lori took a look at it as well. And you had a concern. I just want to make sure that it's indicated here around the ors and the ands. Oh, right. Um, so in section three. Yes. Um, I hear really testing it, my it memory became, too. It became 2D. Section 3 is now 2D. Oh, right. Okay. If you look at it now. So it's on the top of the second page yeah. where it says the HCL, HCA shall at its expense hire a police officer detail for any event. Mm -hmm. um, my issue here is that they they made it that, that both, um, both circumstances had to be occurring in order for there to be that police detail and I thought it should be an or. All three. All three. All three. I agree with you. Yeah. Oh right, all three. Yeah. Um I didn't think that because it seemed to me like what circumstance is ever going to meet all three. Right. 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 Um and so that my recommendation was that it be an or and that any one of those circumstances could require that. So um the only the only other comment that Mr. Minaris had was in regards to, um, he made a comment on section two, um, in regards to how we're defining the front parking lot. And I just said that I had agreed with him that it wasn't, it wasn't entirely clearly defined, but I think this version actually, we, we, fixed we fixed it and we made it that because it literally was just saying the high school parking lot. And I was like, okay, yeah. well, how many front parking lots are yeah. we talking about? So we made it adjacent the to the least, least promises. promises. Yeah. And those are really the, the major changes, just so you're aware, because um, I know this wasn't redlined. Um, but we didn't, it, it obviously didn't make the change yet for the ands and the ors. We wanted to present that to you all to see if you agreed, but if I was, or if I was making it too um, punitive, but I, I thought that that, I thought it was impossible for all three of those to always happen, so. So can I ask a, a, a higher level question <coughs> that I should have sent ahead of time and I didn't, in case we need Mr. Herr, I asked him to stay for a couple minutes. Where is the town and the HCA around the liquor license application? I believe it's by event, correct? So, so it wasn't, a, there was an original liquor license application and that was basically pulled. And then we went back and just kind of went into more of a lease uh, amendment. So there's a lease between the town of Hopkinton and the HCA for the facility. And the amendment to the lease allowed for certain things to take place. There was a dispute about whether the original lease allowed for these types of activities to go on at all. And so part of, we went into a negotiation after the liquor license piece was pulled off the table and went into a lease amendment discussion and negotiation that included them using uh, certain catering companies that had licenses of their own to come on premises to do this type of, uh, hold these types of functions. Uh, so there's no liquor license involved today. The lease agreement took about, or the amendment to the lease took probably two or three months, maybe two or three of our meetings back and forth, but that piece of the puzzle has been solved. Okay. So there is an agreement between the town, the HCA, mm. as to what they can do, how many of them they can do, and you know what the caterer's responsibility will be, and so on and so forth. So that has all been resolved. Now, this parking agreement, I think, is sort of secondary to that, or an add-on to that, that you guys have to be comfortable with. <coughs> and it sounds like there's a little work to be done there with Ray. 
and so and thank you for that clarification because I agree with what you just said, which is that this is secondary to that. So the fact that that has been resolved from the town side, I think that was my only question. If if it wasn't, are we cart before horse here? But it sounds like if that's been resolved, then we're at the right we're at the right point. I so. think you're at the right place okay. and it's the right time to get this piece done to your comfort level. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Okay. So just a question about the or. Mm -hmm. um, back to that is that going to then require that if they had a small event going on a, you know, like a couple of girl scout troops or something using the hca they would then have to get a police detail if there's something no, going it's, on here it's really the alcohol no it, it's no, not but if you change or. it to say or right yeah. number two is yes. just if they're having an event while there's also an event oh i see it's supposed to be all three of these conditions have to be in place so one of the things that they said was if there's fewer than 100 guests, I don't know about that part, for the duration of the event. She gave me an example about having an event where there'd be a 20 minute <coughs> intermission um, and you know there wouldn't be an opportunity in, her, in what she was arguing for anybody to have too much to drink. Um, but the number of guests, I think, was more managing the parking lot, mm -hmm. so more than 100, and when the parking lot is being simultaneously used. So if it's summer and we're not even right. present and we're not using the parking lot, um, or, I, I mean, there is rarely an evening where there's nobody in our parking lot. But the idea was, the reason the and was there was that if the school parking lot is being used simultaneously by us, and the third condition was there's alcohol being served. If none of those conditions were in place, for example, if there were one more than 100, and we were in session, but there was no alcohol, then we didn't feel that there would be a police detail necessary. So if alcohol is the only thing here, then mm -hmm. what I would suggest mm -hmm. is where this first sentence, the first part of the sentence, where, and thank you for bringing that up, Nancy, because I didn't recognize that, but certainly the Girl Scouts aren't in need of a police detail. <laughs> um, the, <laughs> the HCA shall at its expense hire a police detail for any event at which alcohol is served for more than one hour and then I would do the ellipsis, um, or the, sorry, I'm not working very well in my brain today, but Francis. whatever the two dots are. Colon. colon? Yes, there we go, the colon. Um, and then have it be with 100 guests or more in attendance, or it could be and or. Mm -hmm. I see. I think that's. I think you're right. I think that the, it's the fact that, that the, alcohol the alcohol is put factor is the alcohol sort of right? in as, as an sure. equal factor, and that right. should be the governing factor. Okay. Yeah. It's fine. Because we're not worried. Start with alcohol. One. Mm -hmm. Are Adam we? Poland. Are you worried about having a police detail if alcohol is not involved, just based on the size? No, I am not. Okay. Okay. Then that's why I think that should start. I mean, there is something in here that in addition to the police detail, they have agreed when they have an event to, to mark it off. Mm -hmm. We want to know that there's an event taking place, that this is not student parking, that you should be parking somewhere else, regardless of whether there's alcohol served or not. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a, a, a fix. It was C, <coughs> at which alcohol was served, mm -hmm. the cordon off the portion, reserved for parking for that event yeah so also in in what is at least originally that second piece um, when the high school parking lot when the school parking lot we're talking about senior lot right we the, are okay when the school parking lot is being used simultaneously by the HCA and the HPS I, I think you mean that there's an event taking place at the <laughs> HPS no, I don't. Okay. What I mean is that there are students here all the time. It's dark. They're leaving the building and unaware that there's an event taking place over there. They might even still be parked in their own parking spot, although that, although that rarely happens. So now there's somebody that's been in an event at the HCA. It's dark. The students don't know this and are fooling around in the parking lot, joking around with their friends. I just I want them to be aware that there's something going on over there. Okay, so that's covered by the mark. Because the kids yep. often, whether mm -hmm. they're in the building or for right. an event or not, park here. Yeah. They congregate here and carpool. And yep. so there are kids in the parking lot all the time, whether there's, you know, an yep. evening event happening or and not. And as there so, should be, right? We want no, no, to it's encourage great. our kids to be here. But I just so. wanted to make sure 
Yeah. That was all part of that yeah, conversation. Yeah, it wasn't supposed to be just when we okay. had an event and they had an event. Okay. So let me just read this out to the committee so that, I mean, granted, you don't have it in front of you, so if, if you still want to see it in, in writing, that's totally fine, but I just want to make sure that I'm capturing what we're all thinking. But the HCA shall, at its expense, hire a police detail for any event at which alcohol is served for more than one hour, colon, subsection one, with more than 100 guests in attendance for the duration of the event or when the school parking lot is being used simultaneously by the HCA and the HPS. I'm just uncomfortable so, with the 100 number. That's what I was going to say. Maybe I'm being overly, but, but to me it's, if, if the alcohol is being served for more than one hour and there's potential joint usage of the lot, yeah. that feels like when we need that's this enough. in place, Leave right? I, I don't want to get into it was 95 people. All right, so then it just should really be one statement about that. Right. I think it should be. I so don't think the, the 100 is, is about, yeah. All right, so the HCA shall at its expense hire police detail for any event at which alcohol is served for more than one hour when the school parking lot is being used simultaneously by the HCA and HPS. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. Okay. So if it's the summer and there's nobody there and they're having an event, then we're not going to require, then it's not of concern to us. It might be to others, but I, we're not looking for a police detail when there's no one using the schools. And it wouldn't be, you know, part of the parking agreement, but do you have a system in place whereby they're informing you well you Jean thank you for or? reminding me because we have greatly improved that process okay. too it used to just be well they would look at our calendar now they're going through Lou okay mm -hmm. so and you're, so, it's on your radar screen when they're going it's to absolutely something. and and again they've been great to work with um, this other piece came as a result this addition around well what if we end up having an event that isn't previously scheduled and you have made a commitment to somebody to use your your facility we will, you know, work with you because it, we're, you know, we're going to still maintain that we come first. But that's where this piece was, um, that we'd help them find adjacent parking. Mm -hmm. So if there was ever a time when we had to tell them that, you know, something that they previously identified, that they would have the right to the um, 42 identified parking spaces immediately <coughs> adjacent. Now, you asked, Jean, which shall be reserved for physically challenged guests of the HCA, and what, I think you did, I asked and that. Kelly, and what they meant by that was not necessarily physically handicapped, but maybe older, mm -hmm. people that couldn't walk from the Hopkins lot, for example, if that's where they, we, or a mother with lots of kids. Mm -hmm. um, so when they, maybe physically challenged are the wrong words. Maybe we just say, for they, they're gonna identify 42 parking spaces. I don't believe that would ever handicap, it, um, would ever be a situation with, with that one line of parking that would put us okay. in a place where we didn't have sufficient parking. So they were calling it out, not as handicapped, but physically challenged to also include the elderly and, you know, uh, families with small children. Is um, that even necessary to put in there then? Okay, just say, say 42 identified parking, 42 spaces, identified parking immediately. spaces. Yep, sure. Do you um, like me to take John, that out? Does anyone else need Mr. Hur to stay for the rest? Oh no, of I think you're oh. so sorry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> He's waiting yeah. to be called. I'm back like up. the yeah. poor guy. <laughs> um, thanks, right. thanks, Brian. Good night. thanks, Brian. This is probably extraneous, and we're just so. And I don't want to derail cool. what cool. has obviously been a lot of work, but <clears throat> they're not paying <clears throat> us anything for the use of the parking lot, right? They are not paying us anything. Okay. Um, they are working with us collaboratively to offer programs for students and sometimes at no cost. I don't think they charge us, for example, when for the Be Free concert, when the kids are using the space. I don't know. It would be interesting to know that. Yeah. And the only thing, you know, I know that we are out of student parking. And the only thing that occurred to me as I was reading I did this. Ask. Oh, and no. Here's the problem. There are five students that volunteer for them who they have given free parking to. Okay. And they volunteer regularly. And I followed up with Phil on this. Kids pay, I think, $150 for a parking spot? 155 There you go. So they don't pay anything and they have the, op and Phil knows about them so that they know he knows the cars. They can't commit more than that because there are times when they run a program during the when day when, okay. when it's full. And so if we would need it every single day, 
Um, but that was a great suggestion. I hadn't thought of it. I did follow up with them. But let me find out again about, you know, are there programs that you let us use for free, like the Be Free concerts I and just things? I just hope yeah. so. Yeah. Okay. It also might be worth, I don't know, does it, I mean, I guess by its absence in here, I just wonder about do we need to spell that out in the agreement, the lack of a fee, because is it, does it run inconsistent to any of our facilities rental policies? It might. Right. Um, does it not anywhere I mean, say I, don't think park, I don't think parking lot is covered under no, our but facilities, but it, it is it, actually, John. Oh, it is? Yeah. Like when you want to run a, 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 some Road kind race. of event and use the parking lots. Oh. Okay. Then, then it probably should be called out. They should be called out somewhere, whether yeah. it's here yeah. or I prefer no here because I don't want to open that policy back up. <laughs> um, that, that, um, okay. it, it that it's exempt from okay, that. Okay, and do we agree with Kelly's recommendation that with the we're going to take out um, which shall be reserved for physically challenged guests? Yeah. We don't need that phrase. Under 2B. Or you can just say which shall be reserved for guests of the HCA. So you could just take out physically challenged. Okay. And then the other thing under C, as I look at again, um, do we want to say at which alcohol will be served or do we just want to say for any event on the lease premises, the HCA shall cordon off the portion of the school parking lot. I don't see that that's a big deal. You're already doing the alcohol over yeah. here. We're doing the alcohol over there. I'd like them to cordon For it off. For everything. No matter what. Well, it would help. Yeah, it would just help sort of. It, just, would, yeah. it would just train everybody to yep. look for it for all. Do you have to define what an event means, though, in that case? No, I think that it's any, I think it's understood they, they use the event throughout to indicate that there, somebody has purchased is, is using their space for to run something other than <coughs> that would require additional parking. Right. Okay. Right. So you don't need to define the word event. I don't think so. Oh. I mean, you can. You can. You can but define it as. Numbers, so then, then you're going to get into yeah. a discussion with them about what is an event. People. And I think the only thing, the way that I would define it, if I was going to draft it, was any <coughs> anything outside their normal scheduled activities. I guess. So it's not a class. Is it like the pottery show? Is it like the yep. quilting show? Play. Anything like that. OK. So it's, if it's not in their um, classes catalog, it's an event? I don't know. I mean, are there times when they run a class that they need additional parking? There could be. Know. Well, I mean, they have a lot of <coughs> classrooms. So maybe it could be that the accumulative effect of all of those people could. Does that justify an event size? I don't know. I think the event is any at any time when they need our parking lot. Yeah. So when I read this, for any event on the leased premises, the HCA shall cordon off the portion of the school parking lot reserved for that event. Mm -hmm. So whenever they so need our event. So they're overspilling. Yeah. And they Honestly, it's to their benefit, so people it don't park in there yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, my final question is, is there an identified term for this agreement after which we're going to review yes. it or yes. can we elect to um, look well, at the be, number four. It can be terminated at will by either okay. party. <clears throat> Thank you. We agree to meet to review the parking agreement and revise the terms. Um, six months. Six months. And we already have a date on our calendars. Good. So that we don't forget. And when it says terminable at will, like based on the fact that there's no notice period, it means you literally could send a note today and say it's terminated. So tomorrow your language. event has to okay. Can so, I have your language? You, write it down? Yeah, you absolutely can. Um, so <coughs> can I just ask for, I mean, we have a motion here, but we just made a lot of changes. Yep. Do we know that they approve them? No, That's what I was going to ask. That same, I was going to ask that same question sure. in terms of especially that, that oh. particular um, 2D feels like it might be a negotiable. I'll bring it back on the 15th yeah, because we don't currently have any business next week, so I can work with them and bring it back on the 15th. Okay. That's good. So the town has to sign this too? Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you, everybody. All right. So we have moved on to our next opportunity for public comment, and our public has left the building. Oh, yeah. um, so we can move <clears throat> on to items by consensus. And did anyone want to move any of the items by consensus out separately to be discussed or voted separately from the group? 
Okay, then take so it away. Then the superintendent recommends the school committee <coughs> moves to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano, seconded by Mrs. Cavanaugh. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? No, and it's unanimous and so carries. And at this time, I would seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion by Mrs. Birchman, seconded by Mr. Graziano. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And it's unanimous and so carries. And our next meeting is Thursday, December 8th at 7 p.m. here in the high school library, which is another special meeting for budget review. And our next regular scheduled meeting is Thursday, December 15th at 7 p.m. here in the high school library. Thank you and good night.